Hello, this is Food Offensive Weekly News for April 29th, 2013, and if you've been following these weekly uh, news updates and, and videos, then you will know that I've covered a lot on GMO news, and of course that's at the forefront of this uh, food battle we are partaking in, and this week, along with that, I'm going to actually cover a couple of different topics that are hot this week in the news and concerning food freedom and uh, our food supply in general and it's actually both the the, fir the first two stories this week the first two segments will be covering uh, issues of beverages and and the companies surrounding those beverages and so I've got some interesting topics here to cover this week and and I want to get into this right away uh, the first story this week is concerning Nestle and the article headlines have been you know various different wordings but this one from Nation of Change they're actually posting or an article by Anthony Gucciardi of Natural Society I cover a lot of his information every week and I'm just actually just reading from the Nation of Change article in their politics section and of course it was on Natural Society as well, but they've reposted this in its entirety, and uh, this report was published on Wednesday, 20, the 24th of April, and I found out later it's actually uh, this particular issue, and the title is Nestle CEO, Water is Not a Human Right, It Should Be Privatized, and after seeing the video, you'll find out, I'm going to show you a short a short clip of it right now, but basically this is the the C, for he's actually former CEO, and he's now chairman of the largest food product manufacturer in the world. He says that corporations should own every drop of water on the planet, and you're not getting any unless you pay up. And uh, he said that in in not those same exact words, but that was pretty much pretty much what it was. So here's a here's a short clip of that right now, and then we'll come back to the article. So water is actually. Das wichtigste Rohmaterial, das wir heute noch auf der Welt haben. Es geht darum, ob wir das normale Wasserversorgung äh, der Bevölkerung äh, privatisieren oder nicht. Und da gibt es zwei verschiedene äh, Anschauungen. Die eine Anschauung, extrem würde ich sagen, wird von einigen von den äh, NGOs vertreten, äh, die darauf pochen, dass Wasser zu einem äh, äh, öffentlichen Recht erklärt wird. Das heißt, als Mensch sollten Sie einfach Recht haben, um Wasser zu haben. Das ist die eine Extremlösung. So that's ja. it. Pretty, uh, pretty smug and pretty uh, arrogant the way that some of the things that he said in there. And of course, like I said, I found out after watching that that that's actually this isn't a new. Uh, this isn't really a new new piece of information or, or new quotes from him, a new video from him. This was actually, that particular video clip was released in 2005 in, in a documentary called We Feed the World. And basically, uh, this Erwin Ir um, Wagenhofer, he's an Austrian filmmaker. He traces the origin of food we eat and views modern industrial production of food and factory farming in a critical light. And that act that clip actually was was shown at the very end of that at the end of that documentary and very telling very telling in what in what they're actually wanting what they're intending to do but I wanted to get into this article right away here uh, spend not spend too much time introducing it but I wanted to read most of this article it's 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 not that long but he says this Anthony Gucciardi of Natural Society says is water a free and basic human right or should all the water on the planet belong to major corporations and be treated as a product should the poor who cannot afford to pay these said corporations suffer from starvation due to their lack of financial wealth? According to the former CEO and now chairman of the largest food product manufacturer in the world, corporations should own every drop of water on the planet, and you're not getting any unless you pay up. 
the company notorious for sending out hordes of internet warriors to defend the company and its actions online in comments and message boards, even takes a firm stance behind Monsanto's GMOs and their proven safety. In fact, the former Nestle CEO actually says that his idea of water privatization is very similar to Monsanto's GMOs. In a video interview, Nestle chairman Peter Brabick states that there has been there's never been one illness ever caused from the consumption of GMOs. And uh, if you see that that video clip, he'll say that here he's saying there in Europe people are are scared to have it, and, and yet here in America we haven't seen one one illness. Well, yeah, what about what about the all the tests that have come out and the sicknesses we are we are experiencing today? Is that not a correlation of those things? It says, the way in which this sociopath clearly has zero regard for the human race outside of his own wealth and the development of Nestle, who has been caught funding attacks against GMO labeling, can be witnessed when watching and listening to his talk on the issue. This is a company that actually goes into struggling rural areas and extracts the groundwater for their bottled water products, completely destroying the water supply of the area without any compensation. In fact, they actually make rural areas in the United States foot the bill. And I would say also if you've seen the documentary Tapped, it uh, pretty much gives all the details on the bottled water industry and, and exactly what uh, Anthony Gucciardi just stated about them going into these small areas and draining the water supply. You know, big trucks driving through the, semi-trucks driving through these small towns and, the, you know, just terrorizing the, the residents, pretty much. But it says, as reported on by Corporate Watch, Nestle and former CEO Peter Brabeck have a long history of re disregarding public health and abusing the environment to take part in the profit of an astounding $35 billion in annual profit from water bottle sales alone. And then it talks about a report that Nestle's production of mineral water involves the abuse of vulnerable water resources. It talks about a particular instance in the region of Brazil where they have uh, resulted in depletion and long-term damage of that area of the water supply. Going on, it says, Nestle has also come under fire over the assertion that they are actually conducting business with massive slavery rings. And there's another corporate watch uh, entry from 2000, or in 2001 talking about the cocoa production, families, destitute parents selling their kids to be sold as slaves to work on the cocoa farms, and you know Nestle makes the chocolates and things like that too, so that's their ties to that as well. Whether they set out to do that or not, it's, it really doesn't matter because the fact is that it's happening and they allowed it to happen. He ends by saying, so is water a human right or should big corporations own it? Well, if water is not here for all of us, then perhaps major corporations should own air as well. And as for crops, Monsanto is already working hard to make sure their monopoly on our staple products, uh, staple crops and beyond is well situated. It should really come as no surprise that this Nestle chairman fights to keep Monsanto's GMOs alive and well in the food supply as his ideology lines right up with that of Monsanto. Yeah, I mean, he... I guarantee this guy doesn't doesn't eat genetically modified food, and if he does, he obviously doesn't understand the repercussions of that. But it, then again, he's in Europe where they've banned most of the of the GM products, so of course he doesn't eat them, and he wouldn't if he had the chance to. So, as far as that goes, that's that's the main information for this story. And you know, he Anthony Gucciardi refers to you know what keeps them from owning the air. Well, probably working towards doing that at some point but you know that's a lot of the comments if you read these articles a lot of the comments people are making are about you know what's next the air and I rem I'm reminded of that cartoon released a couple years ago the Lorax and uh, they talk about you know there's a guy on there that he is you know evil you know entrepreneur guy that, that just, just sells canned air basically to everybody and, and actually just recently a billionaire in China has canned air and sold it to people because it's so polluted there that uh, you know obviously that's a need that someone has but I think that with the the stance that this CEO or former CEO and chairman is taking is is the stance of many of these people where they really want not just 
not just to make the money off of it, but you know, in the in the video, it's it's almost like he's bragging about, you know, these four point five million people depend on Nestle for a job. It's almost like he loves the control. It's really sick when you when you watch it. it you know, the whole thing. You know, Anthony Gucciardi, like I said, this is the actual article here from Natural Society, and some links in there and and things you can follow concerning that. But that's the, that's the actual article that that people are pe reposting and then referring to. And uh, I will also end with some points from the Natural News article on this. He says, Nestle's CEO seeks to control the world's water supply. And uh, Lance Devon is writing this for naturalnews.com. And he says, gun control may be a hot topic, but what about water control? And he talks about the recent comments that have, have uh, surfaced from the former CEO he wants water controlled, privatized, and delegated in a way that sustains the planet. You know, that's the other thing. And, and this guy, you know, you can, say, you can say on one hand, well, maybe he means well in the fact that he's trying to provide a sustainable water source and help control it in a good way. The problem is when you talk about a, a few individuals controlling something, you know, it's one thing to have, you know, a couple of large, uh, you know, a couple of people running the thing and, you know, you've got a socialized, a socialized society, but that would be probably be not so bad if, you know, Jesus Christ was running it. But the problem is you've got people that don't have the best interests of the people running it. And so obviously it, it, it corrupts it quite quickly and we can't trust just one or two people to run things. And so that's what, you know, obviously they would like to do that. And, you know, they talk about sustaining the planet and it always it always starts you know with gmos i've made reference to this many times gmos and other ish and other things that we're dealing with in our in our fight for our fruit freedom and, and and healthy food in particular is the fact that you know it always starts out something good as 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 touted as oh this is great for the environment it's great for people it's going to feed people you know we always they always pull on those you know, our, our true, our true hearts as, as humans is to be, you know, help one another and, and do the better good for mankind. And I mean, I guess if you're a decent person, you want those things. They always go after those heartstrings. And, and the fact of the matter is that really isn't what they, what they want to do. And, and for them, sustaining the planet and controlling the water supply means raking in the profits and controlling who gets what, when, and how, and we eventually become slaves to them. There's a subtitle in here, Water Control Hitting the United States. It says, one day cities and towns may be forced by international law to limit each household to a set amount of water. People have to obtain a permit to dig wells or pay fines for collecting rainwater. It says may have to. Laws like these are already in motion in the United States. Well, I would say there's already there's already laws in place. I mean, here right here in Colorado, where I'm broadcasting from, they just recently they've allowed rainwater collection in the rural areas. I mean, you can't do it in the city still. But up until earlier this year or late last year, they you couldn't collect water anywhere. If you're a farmer, if whatever, you can't collect the water. Um, so this is already done, and you have to tell them, in a lot of places, you have to tell them when you're going to dig a well. Um, and, of course, those things, those laws all start, like I said, with good intentions in mind, but the fact of the matter is it always ends up controlling us one way or another and uh, that refers to rainwater collection natural news article nestle's ceo thinks all water should have a price he says he he works for a company who rakes in 65 billion dollars in profit each year he proudly claims that millions of people are dependent on him and his company does this guy think he is a god well he might um now a third of the world's population may um now, a third of the world's population may face water shortages within 15 to 20 years. By price controlling water, Brabeck believes he may save the planet from food and water shortages in the coming years. But, this is the question that we face, is it necessary to strip all humans of their natural liberty to water, as this guy suggests? And then it says, what, what might happen if international controls are placed on water sources as a select few corporate dictators rule over the water supply? And can a free and thriving people find better ways to conserve and respect water with their own liberty rather than allow global corporations to control it? Yes, this is the issue we're facing, and water really is the main 
I mean, it, it is absolutely necessary to, to life, to our life. This article goes on to say, putting a person like Breivik in control of water would create a tyrannical monopoly on something that was meant to be free. They could dictate which farms received water. Nestle could protect GMO farming. And he also says in the article that organic is food is not the best. And he went on to say that genetically modified food is perfectly safe and causes no disease. So with this philosophy, a Brayback economy would cut off organic farming from the water supply and allow genetically modified food to reign over the people. And I would go back and say the fact of them dictating the, the farming. There's another video I saw on, on YouTube about Nestle, and they were talking to the, uh, this was on Swiss, it was a Swiss info channel on YouTube, but I'll, I'll have the link to the video if I can find it again. But they had the communications director of Nestle there, and he was they were interviewing him, and he was blaming, basically, he was blaming farming for depleting most of the water in countries like Pakistan, where they sell, you know, where Nestle has a thriving bottled water industry. Uh, and they are, yes, providing safe water, but he's going on to blame that, you know, farming being the culprit for depleting the water supply. And whether that's true or not, I obviously didn't, they didn't supply any kind of research on that. But, <laughs> you know, this is the issue. They could eat, they could, with, it, with someone like that at the helm, they could say, well, farm, farms, you're not, uh, you're taking too much water. We're just going to have to cut you off. You know, we're going to, we're going to have to cut you off and you're, guess what? You need water to grow your crops and you're, that's not going to happen. So, so there's pretty much article in there and sign a petition to stop Nessie from dominating the world's water supply. And it, it's really an action alert in a sense because of, of, uh, of the, the, the action that we can take on it. And another article from, from market watch, uh, referring to it and taking some quotes from, from the video, so on and so forth, is, is right here on screen. I'm not going to read through it, but it's another source for this article as well. And the title is, Nestle CEO warns water scarcity is a major threat to the food industry. And it is. Water is absolutely vital and it's absolutely necessary. But I'm not going to allow one, con one company to control the whole source of it. And so, like I said, the, this week would really be covering a lot of issues concerning the beverage uh, spectrum of our of our food supply and our our intake of of these products and what's safe and what's not well this next topic i want to cover this week was concerning some articles about an article for market watch titled 10 things coke pepsi and the soda industry won't say and you can read that article from from market watch Lots of uh, statistics and things concerning the different the top soda manufacturers, but really through through that through an article like that, I found this big one that I really want to go over, and it's basically talking about soda soda philanthropy, and it's it's from a report that was uh, published by the Center for Science in the Public Interest, and that's it was it was actually released this year, twenty thirteen, so. This is an actual new and and in the you know on the front of the front lines of what's going on here and they they title this report selfish giving how the soda industry uses philanthropy to sweeten its profits and I want to go over a few things in the summary but down in this down further in the report. Uh, basically kind of sums up what it is, and it says this report examines how an industry under attack has used philanthropy to buy silence, enhance its credibility, and nurture allies, especially among groups whose interests do not intrinsically align with those of soda marketers, such as health and minority-focused adv advocacy groups. Yeah, exactly. I covered uh, several times in the last few weeks about the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, having Coke as one of their vendors at continuing education and, and conference type settings, you know, that's a, a little bit of a conflict of interest there. But uh, it also says that this report highlights how the soda industry uses philanthropy to advance its corporate agenda and deflect calls for government programs or laws 
aimed at reducing soda consumption. Now, like I said, I wanted to go through some of the the executive summary and, and so and so on, but a couple of things it points out several things that the soda companies use using philanthropy in their in actually their own interests, and it says uh, they link their brands to health and wellness rather than illness and obesity, and they create partnerships with respect did health and minority groups to win allies, silence potential critics, and influence public health policy decisions. And I wrote in my notes the A and D. I mean, that's a perfect example of, of, of what they call innocence by association here. It says, though the industry's financial support enables their groups to pursue their worthy causes, it ultimately serves to link soda company brands to an image of health and wellness rather than health problems talks about exploiting uh, minority groups to advance their policy objectives, philanthro marketing, and it just really talks about in the introduction about how sugar drinks being once an occasional treat, they have recently moved into the public health radar screen as a significant contributor to obesity. Carbonated soft drinks alone have netted more than $38 billion in revenue in, in 2011, 31 gallons of non-diet soft drinks per year and 13 gallons of other such sugary drinks as sport drinks, sweetened teas, fruit beverages, and energy drinks. In 20, the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans acknowledges the link between consumption of sugar drinks and obesity in children and adults. Uh, medical costs of obesity drain between $147 billion and $210 billion dollars annually from the U.S. economy, and costs are expected to rise as overweight youth react or reach adulthood. Yeah, and this is the, with the new Obamacare that's going in, this is the type of stuff that all of us will be paying for. There's some of us that choose not to take part in things we know are going to hurt us as far as our food goes, but yet we're going to have to pay for the people that, you know, don't give a rip, and we're, we're paying for, for their health care. It's ridiculous. Uh, it says the soda industry has responded aggressively. They have unprecedented amounts of money on lobbying and massive advertising and public relations campaigns. So that's the thing. When you, we've, we've learned that when you give a politician money to run his campaign and become elected, when he then with the promise of when he is elected that they're going to give special treats to the companies that help them get there and it's really, it's a rigged game. It's a rigged game, absolutely. So I wanted to cover that this week concerning that. I mean, it's a 46-page report. You get the PDF version of it. And uh, I have the link in my video, of course. And it, it's really, really lengthy. gives a lot of, just a lot of great information. So I, I recommend reading that in, entirely. But I wanted to point out just what it was about and, you know, show you the cover of it and things like that. And a selfish giving how the soda industry uses philanthropy to sweeten its profits. And I've only got a few more minutes left uh, in this week's episode, but I really wanted to cover what has been an action alert for us for a couple of months now, and, and we've just ended, a few days ago, ended the deadline, we we crossed the deadline for our ability to you know give our input on the whole genetically modified salmon debate that was extended for us and and we you know hopefully hopefully the FDA has been swayed on their decision but they originally said that it was safe to use and and they were possibly going to go ahead with it and you know we're going to find out here in the in the coming days and weeks if it's going to become approved or not and uh food food democracy now of course you know they put out all I use a lot of these action alerts that they put out and this one is talking about how the company behind GMO Salmon, which is called Aqua Bounty Technologies, is already celebrating its pending approval. There was a Reuters story that uh, quoted CEO Ronald Stoddish of Aqua Bounty saying that he fully expected the FDA to approve Aqua Bounty's GMO Salmon in 2013. So I don't know if he was saying that to uh, you know quiet the dissent or he was really confident because he has an inside track and hey he might have given just the right amount of money to uh to the right people to get it done and that's very possible he 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 might be right and I hope he's not but 
It says, does, does Aqua Bounty know something we don't? We need to let the FDA know that American people don't want to eat GMO salmon, the world's first mutant animal for human consumption. I mean, this is coming down the pipe, and we're going to find out now our, you know, the fate of that is being decided. Uh, there's an article from Wednesday, April 24th, Suzanne Goldberg, Goldenberg. She says, uh, GM Salmon's global headquarters, 1,500 meters high in the Panamanian rainforest. Supersized, genetically modified salmon grow fast and fat, and after years of wrangling, are ready for market. But is the market ready for them? And why is the firm hidden away in Panama? Yeah, she, she brings up this interesting point that why is it where it is? And I'm going to go through some points she makes in this article uh, from The Guardian here. It is hard to think of a more unlikely setting for genetically experimentation or for raising salmon. A rundown shed at a secretive location in the Panamanian rainforest, miles inland and 1,500 meters above sea level. And talks about how we are in the U.S. government is entering into the final stages of its deliberations on whether to allow this genetically modified salmon to uh, become into production. Uh, it says, uh, separately, a committee in Congress on Monday took up a bill that would outlaw GM salmon entirely, essentially destroying Aqua Bounty's commercial prospects in America. If approved, the salmon could be the first of some 30 other species of GM fish under development, including tilapia and trout. Researchers are already working to bring GM cows, chickens, and pigs to market. You know, there's so many things waiting in the wings. And the biggest issue with this fish debate, you know, we can we can look at the statistics and, and assertions that uh, researchers and top, you know, experts have in, in this field and look at the negative aspects of it. And there really isn't any positive ones that I've seen that are worth pursuing. But you can look at the negative ones and we can say, well, how about what if all those negative ones did not exist and this was okay? The problem is, I think, with this issue, the biggest issue is the fact that if this goes through, it's going to swing the door wide open for not only, as this article says, the other species of fish under development, but also all these other animals that could enter our food supply. It's extremely dangerous and extremely uh, scary, actually, that what could happen as a result of this one decision. And Aqua Bounty has spent millions of dollars developing this, and so they have a lot to lose, but a lot to gain if if they win. It's it's a high risk endeavor that they've that you know they've put their money in the slot machine and pulled the handle, and, and it's they put it all on the line. They have gone all in on this, and so the place that Aqua Bounty is using right now, it says there was little outward sign of history in the making. There was a faded green industrial shed, four large above ground pools, and and a high wire fence. And it seems abandoned until you walk up to it, and then there's a, you know, a guard will subtly approach. Any visitors that approach the fence will actually emerge out of what seems like nowhere, probably. But uh, it says on the site there are up to 5,000 salmon ready to go, or at least growing right now. It says this facility is leased from a commercial fish farm that produces non-GM rainbow trout for export to the U.S., and this non-GM fish farm also raises organic trout for the up market supermarket whole foods so this is something that's interesting i'm not saying that whole foods is in on this but if i was them i would get way away from this i would say you better get you know they've already taken a stance on gmos and being allowed in their stores and saying that it they won't be allowed by 2018 as far as unlabeled ones but the problem is you know there's a danger right here and right now that i would be extremely concerned about if i was them with a product that I'm selling being grown next to this other fish that, you know, how do we know that it's, it is what they say it is. It says it was not entirely clear why Alcabani chose this out of the way location. Uh, and the, and the company refused to comment and they show a picture that I've shown many times with the GE salmon in the background and the foreground is the regular size salmon. And they do this by injecting growth genes from a Chinook salmon and a seal eel into an Atlantic salmon. The new genes made the fish produce growth hormone year-round. They can bring the fish then to market in 18 months instead of 30. Well, you know, they're still crossing genes here. This isn't this isn't a uh, you know organic hybridization. This is crossing gene genes and and screwing with DNA. And we've seen that that's a that can be recipe for disaster. Akabani had difficulties finding a place that grow to salmon to market size. 
Uh, they tried many countries. The company eventually turned to Panama, where the project won a warm welcome from government officials. Officials had few concerns about the potential health and environmental risks of growing the salmon in Panama. Well, yeah, I'm sure they were given a nice little handshake with money in it. The company has run through more than $60 million waiting for the FDA. The FDA, they have got a lot of money in this game. I already said that. So FDA approval would also, I would like to note that it would only allow Aqua Bounty to produce salmon at its existing facility. So then they would have to, they would require additional approval. So there is some more jumps for them to, you know, hoops for them to jump through, which is good, but that doesn't mean we're in the clear and that everything's going to be okay because we already know that companies can just pretty much run all over us and, and uh, be allowed to do whatever they want. Talks about, you know, we already have GM corn and soybeans, but this would allow, be the first food animal. You were talk, taking it to a whole par other part of the food supply. There's, uh, they just got a shipment of 25,000 eggs from their lab in Prince Edward Island last month. And 18 months from now, they could be bound for American supermarkets. So that is absolutely a pressing issue that we need to keep an eye on. And I'll keep you updated on anything else that comes out from that. But uh, there's another article from Organic Bi uh, Organic called Organic Bites from Organic Consumers Association. And they have essays of the week that they post. And there is a farmed salmon boycott that they're trying to do there's a documentary about it and why it's not good for the environment and good for the wild species at all so that's that's that this week but that covered some beverage items covered some some action alerts concerning the genetically modified salmon but until next time this is food offensive weekly news thank you for joining me